All right, so I got a consult. I got a call from my good friend, Al Hillel, who, as most of you know, is a laryngologist at the UW. But Al has some hidden talents that a lot of people don't know. Um, and I'm going to tell you about him. So he called and said, hey, I just got a call, and I'd like you to see this consult. And I'm like, sure, yeah, what do you got? He says, well, it's a 35-year-old male with severe chronic sinus disease. And I said, okay, uh, you got it. Bring him to clinic. He says, well, we can't quite come to clinic. This is where we got to go. And so we took a field trip to the zoo. And actually, he says, can you go tomorrow? The vets just called and want you to go there tomorrow. I'm like, well, I have a pretty full clinic. <laughs> he says, well, they really need you now. I said, all right, let me cancel some human patients. <laughs> so we moved some patients around so I could go to the zoo. It's pretty sad, but uh, it's true. Uh, and so Al and I went to the zoo to meet this guy. His name's VIP. It stands for Very Important Primate. And he's a 430-pound Western silverback gorilla. He's the alpha male. He is the reproducing male gorilla at the Seattle Woodland Park Zoo. And he had a sinus infection. So how do you know a gorilla has a sinus infection? Any idea? Well, there's a lot of cues. First is snot pouring out his nose. And you can see the purulence coming out of his right, sorry, left nostril. Uh, but more concerning was his decreased fraternization with his female gorillas from seven times per day down to two times per day. And that's very concerning for the zoo staff. So something was really wrong. Um, and so we, we went there, and, and you see these signs as you go behind the scenes at the grill house, dangerous area, no admittance except authorized personnel. That's OK. And then other signs, animal escape recovery supplies. And you see large net, medium net, snares, gloves, and kennel. I'm like, where's the taser? Where's the dart gun? Come on, people. So I was pretty terrified, uh, not to mention the Jurassic Park look to the behind the scenes area. And, uh, and the vet warned me, he's like, all right, when you see Vip, the gorilla, you have to speak softly, don't make eye contact, <laughs> and you have to sit down on this little tiny stool so that you're at head level. So this is Al Hello and myself in the gorilla house. <laughs> and it's pretty uh, intense in there. It smells really nasty. Uh, like pot, like marijuana. That's what a male gorilla smells like, skunk, if you will. Uh, but we're in Seattle. This is Washington, so we can say pot, marijuana. Uh, so this is this is him, and and sure enough, when by the time I saw him, now he had purulent mucus coming out of both the right and left nostril. And to the vet's credit, for three, so each month they took a culture for, of the snot coming out of his nose. And it showed a various uh, amount of bacteria. Bacteroides was first, then Moraxella, and then Enterobacter. E. coli was cultured when I did an endoscopy. And they did a nice job. Culture-directed antibiotic therapy. That's a theme that you're going to hear probably ad nauseum tomorrow by me. Uh, but it's an important theme. So we sat around in a group of about 10 of us with the gorilla keepers, uh, Hillel and myself, and the head vets. And they said, all right, what should we do? I said, well, if this was a human for Enterobacter, we'd put him on Cipro, because he was on other medicines. We'd try prednisone to decongest and open things up, decrease the inflammation. And I said, also saline sinus irrigations. I was so naive. And I said, do you think we could do that? And it got really quiet. And they looked at me and they said, you do it first. <laughs> so I changed the plan. I said, no way. Uh, and, and he actually got really sick, literally within a few days of us changing the antibiotics. He got deathly ill, stopped eating, stopped drinking, and we took him to an off-site CT scanner. The zoo doesn't have a CT scanner, no surprise. Um, but Rob Liddell, who is a board member of the zoo, owns or partially owns the, the CDI, uh, which is by Northgate Hospital, about a five-mile drive. And five-mile drive at Seattle, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock traffic takes about 30 minutes. So the Seattle police thought it would be a good idea for a police escort. So they had the zoo ambulance, the police escort pulling into the CDI parking lot. A bunch of people gathered around, and they roll out VIP, the gorilla. And I'm pretty sure people thought we captured Bigfoot uh, because this is what the guy looks like. And this is him on the CT scanner. He's intubated, not hooked up at the time. Uh, but he's just a, a beast, just a machine of a guy. And the, the 
the comical part are the soft wrist restraints in this photo. And it's like that would do anything if you woke up. Um, so I did an nasal endoscopy, got a deep culture, which did show E. coli. Uh, we got the CT scan, which was pretty fascinating. This shows just complete opacification of every little nook and cranny he had. He uh, had maxillary sinuses, frontal sinuses, completely opacified. You cannot see the septum. Uh, they, the gorillas have this deep frontal bar, which gives them that really kind of ornery, serious look uh, compared to our sinuses. And very, very tiny ethmoid sinuses. So when you think of what do we use the ethmoids for, that's the corridor, right? We were just in the ethmoids. 90% of surgery is through the ethmoid corridor, and gorillas don't have that corridor. So that's concerning and interesting. They do have sphenoid sinuses, and in fact... Look at this nice little anodi cell that he has. So pretty cool anatomy that compares between the two. Uh, very small brain cavity, thank goodness. Otherwise, we'd be locked up in the zoo right now if they had our brain. But as I said, he was really sick. And by the point of time we got into the CT scanner, he had erosion through his maxilla. He had erosion through his skull base. Uh, and, and just to show one more comparative anatomy uh, slide between the human on the right, the gorilla on the left, obviously, this is the nasal cavity. And if you looked at that, you really couldn't tell the difference. They have turbinates, they have deviated septums, and it's very, the anatomy it comes down to is very similar. Their dimensions are about twice as long, twice as deep as our sinuses, but just as narrow. In fact, a little bit more narrow. So this is what he looked like after the CT scan. Not the happy, cute, cuddly picture that he had before. Massive facial edema, his eyes were swollen shut, his tongue was protruding, and clearly the infection was spreading outside of his sinuses. So this was extremely fortunate that my good friend Amy was having her sinus course at Virginia Mason, and the zoo is like, we're gonna have to put him down within a couple days, because he's not eating and drinking, he's in the fetal position in his cage. Uh, and so I went around and talked to my good friends at Medtronic, Cook, uh, Stryker, everybody, stores, and uh, said, we have to uh, go on a field trip to the zoo. I'm like, what? And, and I left a couple of voicemails for some of my friends, and they called back, did you say zoo? I'm like, yeah, because this is the operating room at the zoo. They have nothing, and you cannot use human equipment on animals and never use it on humans again, but the cadavers don't care. So again, fortunately, Amy had her course, and we were able to take him straight from her course over to the zoo. We also flew in a bunch of important equipment uh, from all these companies and turned it into an OR. This is uh, the VET2 Kelly Helmick intubating VIP with basically a garden hose and a huge laryngoscope. I think I saw that on Dr. Manning's pediatric set the other day. Uh, his VIP's nose is, he has a very unique nose. This thing is like an accordion, and I know it's a dark photo, but you can see how it stretches from not stretched to stretched, and that circuitous path was problematic. And I was thinking, what am I gonna use to stent this open? And my good friend Chris Moe has designed this thing called the Spyway, which is a uh, silastic, basically, corridor, almost like a nasal trumpet, to keep the neurosurgeons from banging into the tissue when they're doing non-visual sighted sinus surgery or pituitary surgery. So I was really happy that he was able to donate those for this cause. Never would have done this surgery without image guidance. We've got some great pictures of the image guidance. And uh, Hilda, who's here today, she was holding the magnet for the fusion the entire time and they finally got her this little garden mat that she could kneel on but the vips head was so big we had to constantly rotate the magnet around uh, it was a normal day at the or jamie uh, my scrub tech donated her time we all donated our time fred bake he was on his rhinology rotation uh, so he got to come up angelique is on her rotation right now and hopefully we don't have to do this again angelique sorry um, but it was a normal day until you look down and you see things like gorilla feet and gorilla hands. And uh, it was just strange. And, and this is now a very good friend of mine, Dr. Collins. He is vet one. He is in charge of 250 animal species at the zoo, um, over 3,000 animals. And the look on his face is like, what is Davis doing with my priceless gorilla? So I was doing sinus surgery, and this is what it looks like. We set up the nav. Initially, I did not use a spyway, but then you'll see it go in in a minute. 
and his tissue was extremely friable, very edematous, and this was the very thick inspissated mucus that looked like fungus, but it was not fungus. Uh, and here's the spyway going in, which I trimmed, and I shouldn't have trimmed because I needed the whole length. But just, it was a matter of cleaning out the maxillary sinuses. There's his middle turbinate, and just packed with very firm polyps. You know, at this point, I'm thinking it's probably a cancer. Uh, but anyway, cleared the polyps, and they did come out just normal respiratory polyps. There's his nasopharynx. And going over to the right side, middle turbinate there, a nice white polyp. And then here's an interesting shot of his uncinate process, taking it out with the back biter and removing some polyps. And a long story short, my surgery time was cut way short. They had to wake him up. She says, we're going to lighten him up. And all of a sudden, his nostrils are flaring. I'm like, holy cow. I needed about another hour to do his frontals, which I did not have a chance to do. So I stuck a propel up in the frontal recess on each side. And this was July 2014. So this was actually the first time I ever used a propel in a creature. <laughs> um, and, and that's just me kind of thinking, great. Um, I hope he wakes up OK. So his surgery actually went pretty well. Uh, it was one of the hardest surgeries I've done just because of his massive inflammation. And I started thinking, well, how are they going to wake this guy up? Is he going to hemorrhage? And, and this is how you wake up a gorilla. You put him in the lateral decubitus position in his cage. And there's this little tiny hatch right here that the anesthesiologist is using her best judgment to say, all right, I think he can protect his airway now, and reaches around, pops the tube, and that's it. There's no jaw thrust. There's no reintubation. If he loses his airway, he's done. Uh, so fortunately, he woke up fine and did well. And post-op day one, he was eating again. Uh, his facial edema had decreased. The vets put him on a different antibiotic. And this is not me. I feed him long fruits like cantaloupe and bananas and they feed him grapes because they're braver than I am. Uh, so that was all good. And we're high-fiving each other and I was pretty happy until post-operative day three I got a call. Phipps not doing good. Something's wrong. And he had fistulized. All of that soft tissue edema finally made its way out and it was Frank Purulence. The gorilla keepers in a different room said so this <coughs> pop. They ran in. He had the submandibular fistula with pus all the way down his his chest wall. They put him back on Cipro to cover the E. coli, which grew out because it was resistant to Augmentin. And Augmentin's the antibiotic that they put him on after surgery. So they had to, this is a picture of the dart, which is actually about 12 inches long. They had to dart him twice a day for two weeks because he was refusing to uh, take his nasty Cipro. So I went to check on him probably about every day. It was the most stressful week of my life. Uh, just waiting for the headlines in the newspaper that I killed a gorilla. Uh, and there was one day where I went to check on him, and, and he fistulized, as I said, but he also, the pus finally came out of his orbit laterally, and here it is. Wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> so as disturbed and bothered as I was, Vip was happy. He was, he was good with this. He said, that's okay. It tastes like tapioca. Uh, and so life went on and he started to make good progress, his fistula, and, and I'm freaking out at this point saying, we got to go back, we got to wash him out. And the, Dr. Collins, the vet says, just wait, gorillas have amazing immune systems. Let's be patient. And sure enough, within seven days, he healed up. The facial edema and swelling went away and life was good. And, and the, the, the downside is this week that I did his surgery, we were supposed to be out of town. We were going on a family vacation. I canceled it to do a surgery. Um, and, and so we were doing a staycation and, and we went horseback riding. The reason I'm telling the story is I went, was running late, went straight from the horses to the zoo to check on him for a standard post-op check. I sat down and all of a sudden Vip ran up to the front of the cage, slammed it and threw hay at me. I'm like, Vip, you're feeling better. This is great. And next I hear little Stephanie, one of the gorilla keepers, she goes, uh oh. And all of a sudden I was covered with hot, sticky E. coli gorilla poop from head to toe. And I think it's because I smelled like a horse. That was my guess, because we have a pretty good relationship. Um, and I went back to the car where Ann and the kids were waiting for me. And I said, does anything smell funny? And my wife says, no, but you got something on your ear. And sure enough, I, I missed a spot on my ear. I did wash out the poop in my eyeball, which was lovely. 
so after that, he started to do well. He made progress and we started eating and doing fine. And that was him about one month after surgery. He went back to the gorilla normal area. Uh, we had an opportunity to take him back because he had a fractured canine. This was six weeks later. He was going to have a general anesthesia anyway, so I wanted to wash him out. Uh, he, uh, uh, that's Neil Futran holding up his nose so I could get the scope in. That's a nice thing for the department chairman to do for me. And he still had some infection, so it was nice to go in and clean it out. Uh, but overall, the inflammation was getting better. Uh, there was some fungus on this culture, and so we did fungus. And this is me just sucking out good old gorilla snot. So then I knew he was getting better a few months later when I got this email. And to put it in context, I took this picture of Vip in his gorilla house. And this is his sleeping chambers. I always thought, what are the fire hoses for? Like, why does he have all those? Maybe to swing from the fire hoses or something? And this email really clarified it for me. And Darren says, VIP was having gorilla friendly relations with one of the females while climbing on the fire hoses. The aerial copulations on the suspended fire hose is a great indicator of how well he is feeling these days. It doesn't get any better for a male gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> so now I know what the fire hoses are for. Uh, and life was pretty good. We found out that his beautiful girlfriend, Nadiri, pictured on the right, was uh, pregnant. This is now a year ago. And their gestation is nine months, so we were excited to see that in the fall. Uh, but in August, you know, once you operate on a patient, you own them, right? And now I'm on call 365 days a year with the zoo. He started holding his head, clutching his chest, eating less, grumpy, and not having sex as much again. That's the bad sign right there. So they said, well, maybe he's got a sinus infection. And I'm thinking, great, every time you know something happens, he's going to have a potential sinus infection. So I said, all right, well, I knew I left the skull base and the frontal sinuses. And I said, yeah, there's a decent chance that the polyps are there. Um, so this time, um, oh, this is when I went to check on him, and he punched my iPhone, actually broke the screen. Uh, but this time I brought a bunch of friends from UW Medicine. I brought my uh, cardiologist and his echocardiographer and, and his support staff. I brought Drew Ayers, who's the, my go-to allergist. You'll hear from Drew tomorrow and his staff. And we actually did allergy testing on Vip the Gorilla, and this is the skin testing on him. Turns out Vip the Gorilla is allergic to dust mites, elm trees, which are prevalent here, and the big one is alfalfa. And for 37 years, Vip was sleeping on an alfalfa hay bed. And it's all throughout their gorilla house. Now, there's no more alfalfa hay at the gorilla house. There's this expensive wood wool mixture. Vip gets singular. He gets allegra. And now the allergists have him on some sublingual drops to cover, I think it's elm and dust mites. Uh, but pretty, pretty impressive, and uh, this is just doing a, a quick look at the surgery. You can see, looking in the left maxillary sinus, it's better. Uh, the tissue is better, but he certainly did have some polyp recurrence, uh, some purulence out of his frontal sinuses. And so at this point in time, I was able, this is cannulating the frontal sinus with image guidance, and was able to get in and clear out his disease. So that was nice. Um, for now, it seems like he's doing well. But the key thing was November 20th, 2015, <coughs> this little cutie was born. And she has yet to be named, but she, uh, she was born at five pounds and a couple ounces and just doing well. So um, I know I will never have a more interesting sinus case <laughs> ever. And like going to work the next week and just doing sinus surgery was pretty boring. <laughs> but. Uh, but that was my summer vacation story. <laughs>